Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> hey, during the NBA season, one of my favorite shows uh, to watch is Inside the NBA with uh, Charles Barkley, Kenny Smith, Ernie, Ernie Johnson, and Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, hands down, they are the best commentators about the NBA. Uh, when uh, Charles Barkley was in the NBA, all sports writers knew that if you needed a quote, you go to Charles. If you need analysis, you go to Charles. Um, in 1992, uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, Olympic team was called the Dream Team, all made up of <coughs> NBA players, and Charles was on the team, and so a sports writer asked them, they, their next opponent was Angola, and he says, do you know anything about Angola? He says, not really, but I know they're in trouble. <laughs> So when Charles uh, retired from the NBA in 2000, everybody wondered what his next uh, move was going to be career-wise, and it was rumored that he was going to sign with NBC. Uh, but he interviewed at TNT, and he liked their format better. It's going to be freewheeling, and uh, ever since he joined uh, Inside the NBA, it has just, just taken off. Uh, you know, they ad lib a lot. They joke with each other. Uh, Charles uh, has had trouble with his weight ever since leaving the NBA, so he had weigh-ins, you know, see if he could get under 300 pounds. And uh, one of their best episodes was in 2009. Kobe Bryant had just uh, done an advertisement with Nike uh, with his new Hyper Dunk shoes, and uh, Aston Martin drove at him at 100 miles an hour. He jumps over it, and uh, Kenny Smith sees that, and he's on in, inside the NBA, and he says, I can do that. I've got my own contract with Nike, and so he gets the staff there to reproduce it, him jumping over a car. Well, Ernie Johnson hears about that, and he says, you know, it'd be funnier if we drove over him. And, uh, and so how are we going to do that? Well, easy. We can film you, Ernie, driving the car. That's no problem. Uh, how are we going to drive over Kenny? Well, we'll, we'll get a blow-up doll and a life-size, and then we'll superimpose your photo over it and... So here it is. Watch this. And of course, uh, you know, if you've watched sports much, you know how like they run it over and over again. So we're going to look at it three times. <laughs> Here's uh, Kobe doing his ad. Don't worry about it. I got it. I got it. I will be there. Man. I will be there. Perfectly healthy. So Kobe, you're talking this. about your shoe here got first, this. correct? You trust your boy. Right. All right. You trust and then. Your boy? And then. I just want to see why Ron is sitting here to put on some shoes. Just watch what I do, man. <laughs> All right, here we go. Bring it down. <laughs> okay, he's warming up for it. 100 miles an hour. He's over, he's over it. <laughs> I told you. <laughs> ah, I told you. March 31st, 2008, baby. That is how you jump over an Aston Martin, boy. That's how you do it. Surprised at all the reaction you got from that, Kobe? Uh, yeah, I am actually. I am actually. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun. Well, there was, some, there was some reaction right here in the studio from, from a guy named Kenny Smith. I had a little reaction to that. Uh -huh. Are you thinking you can do that, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, just it show everything. I, you know, I have, you know, they, I got my own shoe coming out, too. It's a Hyper Dunk Smith from uh, Nike as well. You know, it's a little, a little bit different. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, uh, you know, you can... You're going to jump, you're going to jump, you're going to jump gonna see, let's see what we're going to do. You know, listen, <laughs> Kobe, listen to this. He, he went out there in the parking lot tonight, and none of us have seen this piece of tape yet. So, and you're, so we're just like you, so we're watching it for the first time. Uh -oh. Go ahead. Uh -oh. MD, what's up? I told you I'm gonna do it, Kobe. Yeah. I'm telling you, I'm ready. Okay. Watch, okay. watch. I got my new I Snickers. I hold this for me, hold this for me. Okay. I got my new Aim Hot Hyper Dunk. Nike made their own shoe for me. Hold on, that's the wrong foot. I'm gonna put the shoe the on the wrong foot, foot. yeah. <laughs> Kenny Smith, boy. Smooth, yes, very smooth. <laughs> You see, <laughs> old school man. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get hurt that much, man. <laughs> hey, look at the shoe you. sitting there in the street, it's though. Oh, no oh. Hey, it ain't lifted him out of his shoe, man. man. Oh. It's not oh, good for man. everybody, man. Oh, my God. That was good. Uh, yeah, my, oh, my guess yeah. is you're not going to be selling any of those shoes. Oh, man. I can't oh, get out of here. Man. Oh, man. There's Ernie driving. Ernie. <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> 
McKinney had a total wipeout. When it comes to measuring up to God's standard of perfection, we all do a total wipeout. Uh, in Romans 1, 18 to 32, Paul makes his case that we can all know there's a God just by looking outside at creation and how perfectly this universe functions. But many of us repress belief in God, and so we fall short of God's standard. And then chapter 2, he makes the case that all of us can know there's a God because all human beings have a natural tendency to judge other people, signal, signaling that we understand the difference between right and wrong. But we don't, even though we judge other people for doing wrong, we do the same things ourselves, so we all fall short of God's standard of perfection. Then in chapter 3, he makes the case that even religious people fall short before God. They have God's word. They know what's right and wrong. They know what's true. But we don't even do what we profess to believe. And so we fall short of God's standard. Now in chapter 3, verse 9, if you want to follow along with me, the Bible's under our chairs. It's on page 1,128. Paul makes his closing statement. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the, cha the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. Here's his final verdict. All of us sin. Are Jews any better than Gentiles? Today we might ask, are Christians any better than other people? We have God's word. We, we claim to believe in God and in Christ. Are we any better off without our faith in Christ? And, and Paul says, no, you're not. No people can make it to God on their own merit. Maybe you're not a believer today and you're thinking, wait a minute, does he say no one does good? No, he doesn't mean no one ever does good. People do good and kind uh, deeds uh, every day. He means that when we measure ourselves with God's standard of perfection, no one does good or no one does good enough. Now he puts his final touch on his argument. He gathers up Old Testament scriptures that show us that no one is good enough. He says three ways that no one is good enough. First, no one seeks God. Verse 10, Romans 3, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. This is a quote from Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20. What a claim. People go to uh, mosques, they go to temples, they go to churches all the time. Aren't they seeking God? Paul says no. They might be seeking uh, fulfillment or self-actualization or to earn some favor with God, but no one seeks the true God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. Uh, Paul uses the Greek word akreomai, which means to turn bad. He says we all turn bad like sour milk. Oh, we may have our moments when we seek God, like when we're lost in the dark, or we get a bad medical diagnosis and we say, God, please. But we all fall short of genuinely seeking God. When I was a kid, I saved and traded baseball cards I knew the batting averages of all my favorite players. If we were to take Paul's argument in Romans 1 to 3, we give the secularist, maybe a person that doesn't believe in God, a, a batting average of 178. We take the moralist, the person that judges other people, uh, knows the difference between right and wrong, we maybe give them a, a batting average of 279. We take the religious person who has uh, God's holy word, and maybe we give them a, le a league-leading uh, batting average of 357. But Paul's case is 357, that's still way short of God's standard of 1,000. You can't walk into God's presence with your sin. We all fall way short. Nobody bats 1,000 is what Paul's saying. That's why he says, don't be judgmental. You can judge somebody else and say, boy, that person is really messed up. But he says, you're messed up too. You know, we look at other people who are not followers of Christ and we say, they're bad. We're good. They're far from God. We're close to God. But it turns out we're not that different from people that aren't believers. We get up the same time. 
We go to the same jobs. We put our pants on the same way. We raise our kids the same way. We're, try, we're all trying to get ahead financially. I don't think we're all that different from non-believers. But Paul's case is none of us is good enough. The second way we're not good enough is no one does good. There is no one who does good, not even one. This is a quote from Psalm 14, verse 1. Paul moves from our character to our conduct. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. This is Psalm 5, verse 9. The poison of vipers is on their lips. This is Psalm 140, verse 3. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. This is Psalm 10, verse 7. You bump into somebody and you're likely to hear profanity. We all have bitterness and anger. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. This sounds like the city of Chicago. And the way of peace they do not know. We, Paul says we know the way to war, but we don't know the way to peace. When I was uh, a sophomore in college, I went to uh, uh, Israel for six months. A uh, professor was a uh, Jewish professor, and it was a great trip. And I learned all, you know, a lot about the Arab-Israeli uh, problem. When I came home, I kind of thought, you know, I know how to bring peace to the Middle East. What a joke. I mean, I've watched president after president fail to bring peace to the Middle East. Paul's right. We know the way to war, but we don't know the way to peace. Langdon Gilkey was born in 1919. He had a great education. His father was a professor at University of Chicago. So Langdon went to the University of Chicago Laboratory School. He graduated from Harvard in 1939 at 20 years of age. His first job he took was uh, teaching English at a university in China. When Japan overran the region in World War II, Gilkey was put in an internment camp. It was called, it was Shadung Province. He survived, so he wrote the book uh, Sha Tung Compound. It was like 2,000 prisoners in the space of like one city block. It was terrible. They had like 20 pit toilets for 2,000 prisoners. Uh, each prisoner had a, a, a small bed, and there was 18 inches on each side, and then three feet at the foot to put all his possessions in terrible conditions. When Gilkey entered the prison, he entered with a confident humanism. The idea that, you know, we're all rational creatures and we're all basically good. Evolution was kind of rising in prominence and the idea that, that mankind is uh, ever rising, aspiring, getting better and better. Uh, we're getting better. So even uh, there's, there's so much good in even the worst of us that we're not all that bad after all. Well, his first couple months uh, in the prison kind of confirmed his uh, philosophy. Uh, prisoners kind of rallied and actors and musicians, they built a stage so they could perform in the evenings. Uh, healthcare workers uh, helped to, you know, meet needs of people medically. Uh, food preparers worked to, you know, provide uh, better food for the prisoners. Uh, sanitation workers tried to keep things clean. Uh, masons uh, built uh, brick ovens to keep the prisoners warm. But then the last two-thirds of his book, uh, he shows how his secularism was piece by piece torn apart as he became face-to-face uh, -face with humanity in such terrible conditions. People began to steal food from each other. Uh, uh, they, they began to fight over space. Gilkey was in one room that had 11 beds and he noticed another uh, prison room that was the exact same space and they only had nine beds so it says hey how about you take one of our prisoners they said nothing doing you kidding me we are completely cramped why would we want to if you send somebody over we're going to throw them out and he realized that everybody works in their own self-interest people are all basically selfish and he realized that rationality could not form the basis for moral obligation. And he began to do a reversal in his thinking. It, it was there that he met Eric Little. You remember Eric Little? He was the uh, Scottish uh, Olympian uh, in uh, Chariots of Fire. 
a strong Christian, and he was in the prison too, and, and Gilkey watched him minister to teenagers, and he saw that only belief in God could provide a real basis for right and wrong and could provide uh, people the, the power, the motivation to sacrifice themselves for other people. When Little died of a brain cancer, everyone in the prison was stunned. And that's when Gilkey moved from his humanism and became a Christian. You might be able to find another prisoner that you're better than. You might find other people you feel like you're better than. You can always find somebody lower on the moral scale. But we're not supposed to measure ourselves with other people. We measure ourselves with God who is holy. And next to him, we all fall short. That's what Paul means when he says no one is good. He means no one is good enough. Third, no one fears God. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Paul isolates the cause of our sin, our pride. We don't respect God. We don't fear God. The result, we're in crisis. So what's the solution to our wholesale problem? Is it the law? No. No one can be justified before God by keeping the law. You may wonder, if no one can be saved by obeying the law, then why did God give us the Ten Commandments? Why did he give us the law at all? Paul suggests three reasons God gave us the law. First, to stop all boasting. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced. When we read God's word, we come to understand what God expects of us. His high standard of righteousness, how high it is, and how far we fall short. You can always tell when a person's getting close to becoming a Christian. They stop arguing. A self-righteous person is always saying, but, but if, but I do this, I do that. And they feel like, you know, they do enough good that they're not as bad off as God says they are. But we understand God's assessment of us. Our mouth is shut. We have nothing to boast about. Former NBC anchor Brian Williams covered war, politics, and the economy, not presentations. But he made an, a, an exception in February of 2009 for Bill Gates. Bill Gates is into big issues, solving, uh, solving global poverty and childhood deaths. And he can't do it alone, so he needs everybody's help. Well, he sought that at a uh, TED Talk in uh, 2009. He talked about how malaria is a very preventable and treatable disease. And uh, that it's passed by mosquitoes mostly. And uh, it's, it's usually in poor countries that don't have very uh, sanitary conditions. And uh, to kind of prove his point, he released uh, mosquitoes in his uh, TED Talk. Uh, watch this. Brought some here so you could uh, experience this. We'll let, let those roam around the uh, <laughs> auditorium a little bit. There. There's no reason only poor people should have, have the experience. All right, so it worked. It got everybody's attention. That was the, that's what went out on the internet, and within a week, 2.5 million people had viewed it. And how about all the other links of people that, that saw it? Uh, one blogger uh, said, Gates unleashes a swarm of mosquitoes on crowd. Well, it was hardly a swarm. There were just a few. Uh, but it, it, uh, it got everybody's attention. eBay founder Pierre Amadar tweeted, that's it. I'm not sitting up front anymore. <laughs> There's no reason for us to boast that we don't have many cases of malaria in our country. And there's no reason for any of us to boast before God. Second, the law was given to hold everyone accountable. And the whole world held accountable to God. God gave his word 
to confirm what we can already know by looking at nature, that there must be a God behind all of this, and we're accountable to Him. God's Word tells us that we will all stand before God someday and give an account of our lives. Third, the law was given to make everyone knowledgeable of sin. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. The law was never intended to provide us a means of salvation. God knew from the beginning that no one could keep the law. What the law succeeds in doing is portraying to us our brokenness. Compared with God's holy standard of, of perfection, how far we fall short. And it drives us to see our need for God's grace. Martin Luther said the principal point of the law is to make us not better, but worse. It shows us our sin and drives us to see our need for God's grace. Uh, I've shared this illustration with you several times over the past few weeks. I, I've done it with uh, hundreds of people. I take a piece of paper. I put God at the top. Uh, he is holy. And then I put my name at the bottom and whoever I'm talking to at the bottom. I say, how do we get to God? Most people try the method and I draw a little ladder up the side of kind of climbing the ladder, seeing how good they can be to come into God's presence, to earn his favor. I say at the bottom you have people like uh, Adolf Hitler, responsible for about 20 million deaths, uh, the, the number of Jews that were killed and people that lost their lives in World War II. And I put Joseph Stalin, responsible for about 30 million deaths in the Russian Gulag. And then I put Osama bin Laden, uh, since 9-11 and uh, terrorist tax six, probably responsible for at least 5 million deaths. I said, these are some of the worst people in the world. Where would you put yourself? Well, most people put themselves like somewhere between 66% and 75%. But before they do that, I say, uh, you know, I've heard Billy Graham talk and Mother Teresa, and they talk about their sin. I'm confident they would put themselves no higher than 66%. Ooh. And the people I talk to are very smart. I've never had anybody put themselves above Teresa and Billy. So they put themselves like 60% or 50%. Well, 50% is an F in any class in the world. And all of a sudden they realize, oh my goodness, I'm in deep trouble. And they realize how far short they fall of God's standard. And so they understand no one is good enough. You can probably find somebody that you're better than, but you're not good enough. Only when you accept God's divine diagnosis are you ready to hear Paul's words, but now, in Romans 3.21. We're going to look at that next week. Paul explains, but now God has intervened by sending his son to die on the cross. You have to hear the bad news before you're ready for the good news. You can't just go in and start talking about God's love and mercy. You first have to explain how far we fall short of the problem of sin. It's like a doctor who only tells you how healthy you are. I want a doctor who tells me the truth about my body. If I have a tumor, I want to know about it right away. And if I have cancer, I want to know that I have cancer, especially if it's treatable. God gave us the law because he knows that the bad news of our terminal condition leads us to the good news. It's treatable. There's a cure. Best of all, the cure is 100% effective. And it's 100% free. No wonder it's called the good news. Have you embraced the good news of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for the death that we deserve so that we could have our sins forgiven and be restored to a right relationship uh, with you. I want to give you time to talk to God if you've never asked God to forgive you of your sins and thank Jesus for dying in your place. You could invite him to come in and be Lord of your life right now. You could do that. If you feel like you've done that, you could thank him once again for sending his son to die for you. 
giving you a shot at a relationship with him. Everybody pray. Lord God, we thank you <clears throat> for loving us enough to send your son to die in our place, take the death that we deserved so we can have life, we can have forgiveness of sins. Uh, we thank you so much in Jesus' name, amen.